Yesterday, a child came out to wander. Caught a dragonfly inside the jar. Fearful when the sky was full of thunder, and tearful at the falling of a star. In the seasons they go round and round, and the painted ponies go up and down. We're captive on the carousel of time. Um, so what I'm going to talk about uh, really is the fact that um, our gastrointestinal tract is teeming uh, with um, uh, microorganisms and they're uh, not innocent bystanders, they have an important role to play in health and disease. And what's emerged really uh, in the last decade or so is that uh, they have a huge influence as well uh, on uh, brain and behaviour. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's known uh, from the preclinical studies uh, and then go on and talk about uh, why we think uh, microbial regulation of tryptophan availability uh, might be important. Uh, and if I have time towards the end, uh, I'll just touch on uh, some of the implications and maybe the opportunities that arise uh, from these observations. Uh, so Professor Nicoletti uh, has already done uh, a super job of giving you, uh, you all a primer earlier uh, on the, uh, the role of the gut microbiome uh, in central nervous system function. But I think it's probably uh, worth reiterating uh, a few things. Uh, and that's, uh, this is really the model um, that we work off then. Um, so um, we talk about a, a healthy uh, gut microbiota, and in adulthood, at least what we mean by healthy gut microbiota uh, at the macro level, I suppose, is that one that is both uh, diverse uh, and stable. Um, so that uh, contributes uh, to a normal gut physiology, and then you get appropriate uh, signaling along this brain gut axis, and that contributes to a healthy status at the level of the central nervous system. Uh, conversely, uh, I suppose if something uh, goes wrong and uh, the diversity of your microbiota narrows uh, for some reason or becomes less stable, uh, then that might lead uh, to uh, deleterious effects at the level of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, which can be transmitted along the brain gut axis to impact uh, at the central nervous system. Uh, and this is a bi-directional relationship, um, so we know as well uh, that stress at the level of the central nervous system uh, can also have an impact uh, on the uh, composition of the gut microbiota in the gas gastrointestinal tract. Um, so we often uh, say that, uh, I guess you know this uh, existence of this axis and the role of the microbiota in it already, because uh, if you've ever been uh, nervous, you've felt uh, butterflies uh, in your tummy, and they're not uh, real butterflies, as this uh, picture suggests. That's the, the brain gut axis in action. Uh, so in terms of how this works, uh, signaling along the brain gut axis, there are a number uh, of different routes. So you've got, uh, for example, uh, neural routes like the vagal connections um, that can be important. There are neuroimmune and uh, neurohormonal routes. Uh, we know as well that these uh, gut bacteria are like many factories, churning out microbial metabolites like short-chain fatty acids uh, that can impact in host physiology. Uh, and I'll come back a little bit later on uh, to uh, the impact of the microbiota on the regulation uh, of tryptophan metabolism. So on, in terms of how we can go about studying this at the preclinical level at least, there are a number of different approaches captured on the slide there. Uh, some of them are, are pretty uh, self-explanatory. How do you, options to perturb or uh, influence the gut microbiota to see what effect that has at the level of the central nervous system. Uh, so as I said, things like probiotics or antibiotics uh, administration, uh, they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but maybe it might be worth uh, going into a little bit more detail on the use of uh, germ-free animals, uh, which is an approach that has been used quite a lot. Um, so this is uh, based really on the fact that uh, the uterine environment is thought to be sterile, and although that concept has been challenged a little bit uh, recently with the uh, suggestion that there might be a placental microbiome, uh, the key take-home message from this slide still holds true, and that's that the major uh, uh, colonization uh, event in the gut uh, the first major colonization event in the gut occurs postnatally. So you can take advantage of that uh, in, in germ-free animals by delivering animals by C-section and then growing them up under sterile conditions. Um, so this isn't a new model. Uh, this has been around for quite a while. Uh, it's just that relatively recently it's been applied uh, to try and understand uh, the things that we're interested in in terms of the microbial influence at the level of the central nervous system. 
so it's not a perfect uh, scenario because obviously there's no uh, clinical equivalent uh, with the exception maybe uh, of the, uh, the boy in the bubble uh, of a complete obliteration uh, of the gut microbiota across life. But it is a really neat uh, proof of principle uh, tool to get an idea of what exactly could be under the influence of the microbiota uh, at the level of the central nervous system. And it's really neat that you, know, you can compare uh, animals who have a microbiota versus ones who don't. Uh, and then uh, you, the uh, germ-free animals are open to uh, manipulation at later stages in life. So you can add in a microbiota or mono-associate mono uh, the germ-free animals with specific bacteria to see uh, whether uh, a particular uh, bacterial strain might be having an impact uh, in this system. Uh, and I suppose if you uh, take the information that's been garnered from all those different approaches, from uses of probiotic studies, antibiotic studies, germ-free animals, um, infection studies, fecal transplantation studies, what's come out of that really is that uh, the behaviours that seem to be influenced by the gut microbiota are relevant uh, for uh, anxiety, um, uh, depression, uh, pain and cognition. And it's not just, um, it's not just uh, those aspects of behaviour that are influenced as well, we see an impact uh, on host physiology as well. So uh, we can see here uh, that germ-free animals actually have an exaggerated uh, stress response as indicated by corticosteroid outputs uh, following an acute stressor. And this ties in pretty well with what we know uh, from studies using different uh, uh, probiotic strains, in this case, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, uh, which is able to reduce uh, stress-induced corticosteroid levels. And this uh, really goes back to uh, some pioneering work uh, done by Sudo and colleagues back in 2004, uh, where they also showed this uh, hyperactive uh, HB axis uh, in germ-free animals and were able to normalize it uh, by colonization of the animals uh, during critical time windows. Uh, we also see an impact uh, on uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, this uh, critical uh, factor for neural survival and growth, fertilizer for neurons, essentially. Uh, and we see in germ-free animals uh, that BDNF expression is altered, uh, uh, or lowered uh, in the germ-free animals compared uh, to the controlled subjects, or to the uh, uh, conventionally colonized animals. I don't have time to go into all aspects of brain function uh, that have been uh, shown today to be influenced uh, by the microbiota today, but. Uh, they're kind of summarized on this slide, and we can see that many um, fundamental aspects uh, of brain function have shown uh, to be influenced uh, by the gut microbiota, many again using uh, this germ-free paradigm. So we see here uh, hippocampal neurogenesis being impacted. We see uh, the integrity uh, of the blood-brain barrier being contingent uh, on the presence of a microbiota. Um, we see uh, the maturation and function of microglia, which is critical for neuroinflammation in the central nervous system, being impacted uh, by the gut microbiota. Uh, we know they have an important role in transcriptional regulation at the level of the central nervous system. Um, and even structurally, we see um, that microbiota um, deficient animals have altered uh, dendritic morphology uh, in important brain regions for psychiatry, like the amygdala and the hippocampus. And as well as that, uh, we've shown recently as well uh, that germ-free animals are actually hypermyelinated in the prefrontal cortex uh, compared to the control animals. Uh, so going back uh, to signaling along the brain-gut axis, uh, one of the things that uh, my lab is particularly interested in uh, in this regard uh, is uh, the impact of the microbiota on uh, tryptophan availability and metabolism. Um, so I guess we all know uh, tryptophan as the uh, precursor uh, to uh, serotonin. Serotonin, of course, being the target for uh, antidepressant therapy. Uh, and that um, is true with the central nervous system. But uh, actually, the largest reservoir uh, for serotonin uh, is in the gastrointestinal tract in the enteric nervous system. So it has a dual role uh, at, at both uh, termini uh, of uh, the brain-gut axis. And although we focus a lot on the um, uh, conversion of tryptophan into serotonin. Many of you will also know uh, that tryptophan uh, is metabolized into kynurenine. That's, this is actually the dominant metabolic pathway for tryptophan. So uh, without going into uh, too much uh, detail, we can see the metabolic pathway here whereby tryptophan, tryptophan is converted into kynurenine and then that proceeds along two different branches uh, of uh, the kynurenine pathway, one leading to the production uh, of the neuroprotective uh, kynurenic acid and the other leading to uh, the neurotoxic uh, um, quinolinic acid. And I suppose uh, the, uh, the simplest uh, summary of how this might be uh, viewed is that uh, 
under conditions where the enzymes responsible for degradation uh, of tryptophan along the kynurenine pathway are activated, and these enzymes are known as uh, indolamine 2,3-deoxygenase or tryptophan 2,3-deoxygenase, IDO or TDO. Uh, and the important point here, I suppose, is that IDO is immune responsive and TDO is stress responsive. It uh, responds to elevations in circulating glucocorticoid levels. But under those conditions, uh, you get, on one hand, uh, decreased tryptophan uh, and possibly an impact on the serotonergic system, and on the other hand, you get an increased production of kynurenine. Uh, the majority uh, of central nervous system uh, kynurenine is drawn from the uh, periphery, uh, so then that can contribute to uh, onward metabolism into these uh, neurotoxic and neuroprotective metabolites in the central nervous system, uh, and maybe uh, an imbalance, which would be more uh, important again uh, in the levels of these neurotoxic and neuroprotective metabolites, which has implications, for example, for uh, cognition. Um, so a couple of years now uh, ago, we were able to show uh, that the, um, the gut microbiota regulates um, tryptophan metabolism. Um, so this is a study in germ-free animals where uh, you can see here that the animals have actually have elevated levels of tryptophan compared to the conventionally colonized animals. Uh, and when uh, we reintroduced the microbiota post-weaning, we were able to normalize uh, tryptophan levels. Now this seemed to be uh, due to uh, reduced metabolism uh, of tryptophan along the kynurenine pathway as indicated by the kynurenine tryptophan ratio. That's what you can see in this, uh, on the bottom right there. Uh, and again, that was normalized um, following colonization. And in terms of the central nervous system consequences uh, for this increased availability uh, of circulating tryptophan, uh, we can see that in the hippocampus of the germ-free animals, uh, there was corresponding elevation uh, in serotonin and also the main uh, metabolite of serotonin, 5-hydroxy uh, indolacetic acid. Uh, and again, this was something that was uh, noted to be uh, sex specific. So we only see it in the male animals and not in the female ones. Uh, this is a kind of a, a busy slide, but this is work uh, subsequent to that study, uh, essentially where we did a, a micro array looking at uh, micro RNAs. And ultimately, uh, the, the take home message uh, is that there was an abundance uh, of, an overabundance of microRNAs of relevance uh, for uh, kynurenine pathway enzymes in the um, germ free animals uh, compared to the controls. And when we looked at this in terms of validating via gene expression, we see uh, alterations in some of the key enzymes like uh, IDO and uh, the uh, CAT1. So as I said, uh, the germ-free animal uh, has some limitations in that the animal uh, is microbiota deficient uh, across the lifespan. Um, so what we were uh, interested in was whether if the, if the microbiota was present uh, and assembled in a normal way, but then disrupted at a later stage of life, does that also result in these same kind of alterations? And that's pretty much what you see here with a targeted microbiota depletion uh, from adolescence, where again, you see the same uh, or a very similar profile to what's observed in the germ-free animals with increased levels of tryptophan, um, alterations in uh, kynurenine and the uh, kynurenine tryptophan ratio, as well as alterations in indices of serotonergic uh, function in the hippocampus. Again, using uh, a depletion strategy a bit later on during adulthood, we were again, uh, although the effects weren't quite as pronounced at this, uh, in this uh, study, we were again uh, shown uh, something very similar in that you've got um, increased levels uh, of uh, tryptophan and uh, probably driven uh, in part at least by a reduction in metabolism of tryptophan along the kynurenine pathway. And it's not just uh, the uh, metabolism of tryptophan and uh, the kynurenine pathway metabolites that are altered in the germ-free stage. You also see alterations in the neuropharmacological targets for uh, these kynurenine pathway enzymes and also uh, or for the kynurenine pathway metabolites, and also for uh, the uh, serotonin receptors. So this uh, study from uh, John Bienenstock, uh, for example, is showing alterations uh, in expression uh, of the 5-HT1A receptor, but also in uh, subunits of the NMDA receptor. Um, so because a lot of the information had come from um, uh, the preclinical arena in uh, germ-free or other or models we wanted to see, uh, whether this might also be relevant, whether it might translate to the clinical setting. So uh, to do this, we looked um, at depression. Um, so you can see uh, some of the classical uh, neurobiological features uh, of depression in this slide here, including uh, immune activation and uh, hyperactive HPA axis. And that's 
in a way, kind of the perfect storm for alterations uh, in tryptophan metabolism. And you can see that's indicated here by an increased kynurinine tryptophan ratio uh, in, uh, in depression. So when we looked at the microbiota in depression, uh, via uh, stool sampling, we were able to show uh, this uh, reduced uh, microbial richness and diversity uh, in the depressed subjects compared to the controls. Uh, and when we drilled down into the data a little bit further, one of the things that stood out to us uh, was that there was uh, an underrepresentation of uh, Prevotella in the depressed subjects, which is a genus of gram-negative bacteria. Um, and that stood out to us because that is increased by the Mediterranean diet, which is thought to be protective uh, in depression. Um, so we have to go back to, uh, because that's, that's a good, uh, an interesting study, and it's, it gives us an association between uh, depression and the microbiota being altered. Uh, but in order to try and get a handle on whether that could have a causal role, we need to go back to uh, our animal models. So in this, uh, this is a transfer of the, uh, the microbiota from these depressed subjects uh, into microbiota deficient animals. Uh, and what we were able to observe was some of the prominent uh, features of uh, depression emerge. So we see um, anhedonia-like behaviors transferred uh, via the microbiota, um, anxiety-like behaviors transferred, very often comorbid in depression. And we also see uh, the transfer of the uh, metabolic feature of increased uh, kynurinine, uh, increased tryptophan metabolism along the kynurinine pathway. Um, so another disorder that we study um, quite a bit, and I'm, I'm going to uh, maybe just go through this a little bit uh, briefly, is, is that of irritable bowel syndrome. And this is a, a functional gastrointestinal disorder. Uh, it's interesting to us because there's a lot of psychiatric uh, comorbidity. Uh, and there's been a lot of interest uh, in it recently, uh, and although it's, uh, it's an unloved disorder, I suppose, from a funder's uh, perspective, uh, there was this recent uh, focus on it in the Nature, uh, Nature Outlook series. Um, but it's been linked with alterations uh, in the gut microbiota, uh, in the concept that maybe uh, that the intestinal bacteria might contribute to the alterations in brain gut access communication uh, in IBS. And what we see in this disorder as well as increased uh, metabolism of tryptophan uh, along the kynurinine pathway. We've demonstrated that a number of times now. Uh, and as you might expect, uh, or, or you would predict maybe based on the preclinical studies, that if the microbiota is altered, you might see some alterations uh, in cognitive performance. Uh, and we see a very subtle uh, in deficit here in the IBS subjects compared to controls uh, in a test of visuospatial uh, memory, uh, which was uh, a consistent feature and noted again uh, longitudinally when we looked at it six and 12 months later. Um, now, interestingly, when uh, we targeted the um, um, tryptophan pathway by uh, the acute tryptophan depletion uh, protocol that reduces tryptophan availability but also reduces uh, kynurinine, we were able to uh, show that the IBS subjects had improved uh, performance on this test, suggesting a role uh, of uh, kynurinine metabolism uh, in that uh, feature. And that ties again pretty well with what we know from uh, probiotic studies, which have shown some benefit uh, in treating certain aspects of irritable bowel syndrome, uh, and also in preclinical studies have been shown to modulate um, uh, tryptophan metabolism along the kynurinine pathway. Um, so I suppose we thought this was uh, it was pretty novel, but it turns out uh, Stalin was using this quite a, quite a long time ago to get uh, look at the microbiota of his friends and foes uh, to get a gauge on their, uh, their mental status. So this is taken from a BBC uh, news report. I like this uh, quote they took from it, uh, where he said, uh, for example, if they detected high levels of the amino acid tryptophan, uh, they concluded that person was calm and approachable. Um, and without, uh, again, I don't have time to go into this in too much uh, detail, and I mentioned earlier the importance of serotonin as a signaling molecule in the enteric nervous system. And there are a number of studies now, for example, from Elaine Chow, uh, showing, showing that microbial uh, metabolites uh, can stimulate uh, tryptophan hydroxylase in the enteric nervous system to produce um, serotonin, so they're uh, important for the maintenance of certain nerdic homeostasis in the gastrointestinal tract as well. Um, so I suppose the summary uh, uh, here is that uh, the gut microbiota can regulate not just um, the availability uh, of uh, tryptophan and uh, its metabolite kynurinine, as well as uh, have central implications for the production uh, of serotonin, but it also influences with the uh, dynamics and neuropharmacology uh, of this pathway. So we see uh, it can influence uh, the blood-brain barrier integrity. Uh, it can also influence the expression of um, 
different receptor subtypes of relevance within the central nervous system, as well as altering the activation states uh, of these key cell types like microglia, uh, which are responsible for uh, uh, cranionine pathway metabolism. So uh, I guess the, the, the take home message is that uh, it's no longer a laughing matter that you've got gut bacteria, it's pretty serious as an important role uh, in uh, brain function. So um, I think uh, I'm uh, almost out of time, so I just got to run through this briefly uh, in terms uh, of the opportunities for intervening here. And there's a lot of uh, biotech interest in um, the possibility that the, uh, the gut microbiota might be druggable based uh, on the uh, success of um, the treatment of Clostridium difficile uh, with fecal microbiota transplants. Maybe you can do this via diet as well, uh, although sometimes uh, some of the aspects of the diet might not be so good for your microbiota. Uh, but another uh, possibility that we've been looking at is this possibility of psychobiotics, which is really uh, a probiotic that might have a mental health benefit. Um, and notwithstanding the challenges for uh, translating uh, the results I've discussed so far uh, in psychiatry, uh, when we screened uh, in our preclinical models candidate psychobiotics and identified one with a promising profile and then administered it to healthy human volunteers, uh, we were able to show that following uh, a month uh, of uh, treatment with this uh, uh, B. Langham candidate psychobiotic, the healthy volunteers reported less perceived stress. There was also a biological correlate of that in that they had a reduced uh, cortisol output to an acute laboratory stressor. Um, and we were able to show by uh, EEG that there was also alterations uh, in uh, brain activity in the prefrontal cortex, as well as uh, alterations in performance on a test uh, of cognitive uh, function. Um, so I suppose the summary, uh, and to conclude then, is that the, uh, the gut microbiota is both stress susceptible and can regulate the stress response. It regulates behaviors and physiology that are important uh, for neuropsychiatric function. Uh, this might be due to its, uh, the capacity of the microbiota to regulate tryptophan availability and conurinine metabolism. And where we're at now really is whether uh, these very promising preclinical findings can be translated to the clinic and whether uh, we can exploit them uh, to try and develop microbial-based strategies for the treatment of uh, stress-related disorders. Uh, and I suppose uh, the microbiome is a lot like life and that all we're looking for uh, is some stability uh, and a little bit of diversity and we don't always get that uh, in our uh, everyday life. Um, so these are just some of the guys back in the, the uh, larger laboratory uh, of neurogastroenterology in the APC. Um, and I just want to leave you with this slide. We're having uh, the uh, neurogastro meeting uh, in Cork in 2017. It's the uh, meeting of the European Society of Neurogastroenterology uh, and Motility. Uh, and we'd be delighted if you could join us there. Uh, so thanks very much for your attention. And the seasons, they go round and round. And the painted bodies go up and down. On the kerosene of time, we can't return.